All right, why don't we get started? Uh, this is Vitaly Golem from GS Capital. Uh, thanks for joining our webcast. We seem to be doing a lot of these these days. Uh, this time around, we wanted to uh, change the pace a little bit and get back to business uh, without uh, talking about COVID and uh, everything that you already heard a million times. Uh, instead, um, Louis Leho and uh, Jenny Sohn uh, from Evergreen Finance are, are going to lead a discussion today about uh, really important things to avoid uh, when fundraising, legal accounting pitfalls, as we try to get back to business here. Um, hopefully for some, uh, some great insights and without uh, further ado, uh, Louis, why don't you take it away? Uh, thank you so much Vitaly and thanks everybody for joining. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you all. I'm also uh, sheltering in place at home. So uh, like the rest of you, I am not immune to uh, kids and dogs and cats in the background. So forgive me in advance for that. Um, uh, really the, uh, the genesis of, of this discussion has uh, today has been really my uh, discussions with the entrepreneurs that I work with and, and really my own experience coming to market uh, again as L2 counsel in the last uh, several months. And, Really what, what I've come to learn, you know, really trying to listen or, or what are the real, real pain points of, of my entrepreneur friends. And they're really threefold. You know, the first is how do I get a legal structure in place that is, you know, a solid foundation and that you can build on it from there. Um, how to set up accounting controls uh, and, and get a system in place so that you're, you're properly managing your money. And, and then third is, the, is just the process of fundraising. And you know, many of us uh, who serve the entrepreneur community uh, are, are um, coming at it with a fundraising angle. And, and I asked Vitaly to join because he's one of the, the, the rare uh, people I know who I trust that, that you know, works in all stages of growth and you know, early stage, mid stage and late stage. Um, and so hopefully uh, the three of us together um, will we'll, uh, we'll be able to contribute some insights. Um, I wanted to welcome my good friend, uh, Jenny Sohn, and, and ask her to introduce herself. Um, I first met Jenny when she was CFO at Evernote, uh, the, the consumer SaaS company, and, and then um, you know, saw her tremendous success at, at Workado, uh, an enterprise SaaS company, and, and uh, have worked with her in a number of different environments and, and seen her in action. And so Jenny, uh, you know, please introduce yourself for a quick second. Yeah, thank you, Vitaly. Thank you, uh, Louis. Thank you so much for having me. So I can only echo what Louis just said. I have worked with founders and CEOs and entrepreneurs, early stage seed, ABC, all the way to late stage companies such as Evernote. And I have come to the conclusion that a lot of people, they're very smart. And if they had uh, been given just a piece of advice, how to go about it, you know, how to operate my business, how lay the foundation for my scale level business, they could have saved a tons of time and resources or you know, save the trouble down the road. And that's what I decided to do it for a full time and decided to join this live webinar with uh, two friends. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so, so really, I think we, we've hit this already, but you know, we, we've seen a lot of startups uh, have great success and, and some fail. Uh, most of the time, that's for commercial or business reasons, but it should never be the case uh, that a startup fails because it doesn't set itself up properly uh, from a legal or, or accounting perspective. And, and sadly, um, there are so many ideas running around that, that sometimes they're unable to package their ideas together and, and uh, and, and raise funds. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the first issue um, that really you need to address a, as, a, as a startup is what is the right legal entity? And, you know, a lot of companies come to me uh, as an LLC already formed. Um, and, you know, at that point, they're already recognizing revenue. Um, they, they, they have uh, now an issue, which is that they, they're worth something and, and they're the wrong vehicle to take in uh, venture capital or, or angel funding as uh, no investor wants to get the passive income or loss uh, that an LLC would pass through 
uh, to, uh, to that investor. So um, when we talk about legal entities, we're really talking about um, putting your business in a box. So first you want to incorporate so you don't have personal liability. Um, put that liability in a box. It's a corporate shell. And then, you know, what kind of corporate shell um, from a tax perspective? Is it something that's going to block uh, the income and loss right there within the box so it doesn't pass through to the investors? Or is it going to be, and that's a C-corp, or is it going to be in a different kind of box where there's where it's a, which is a pass through entity for tax purposes, where the the corporate box is not taxed in and of itself. It gives the investors a K one, and those investors then declare their share of the income or the loss. And that can be a great great uh, entity for somebody who's a high net worth individual who has other uh, income that they're looking to offset with the losses that a startup will generate at, in its beginning phases um, and and sometimes uh, you know that, that that's the right entity to, to use but typically if you're if you're going to need uh, investment capital you're going to want to always be in a C corp because most the, the vast vast majority of investors don't want to go through the hassle of setting up a corporate blocker entity uh, so that they don't have uh, the passive income or loss. So, um, and, and if you do this wrong at the outset and you can always fix it later, but there are going to be some tax uh, implications because when you do that flip from LLC to C Corp, um, you're going to have some value uh, at the LLC. And you, when you get issued shares of a new C Corp, uh, you're going to have a tax impact to you at that, at that point. Um, so again, legal entity at the outset needs to be, needs to be right. Um, you know, another, another issue that, that um, comes up, you know, very frequently at the outset is, you know, how to name your entity. And um, you, you've got to make sure that the name is not only available in, in Delaware, if that's where you're going to be incorporating, and that's where uh, most of us lawyers will tell you is the best uh, jurisdiction to, to form your company. Um, but uh, you, you've also want to make sure that it's not somebody else's trade name that's trademarked, that your domain name is going to be available, um, that the logo you use is not going to be uh, somebody else's or, or infringe on somebody else's. And, and getting that right at the outset will save you a lot of uh, time and money. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've formed a, a startup and people have asked me, well, you know, the co-founders and I have decided that it shouldn't be uh, uh, click.com, but, but brick.com. And, and you got to go back and change all the documents, the, the, uh, the trademark registration, the uh, domain names. And, and, you know, this is uh, this is a giant waste of uh, time and money. Um, worse yet is you, uh, form a, a name and you and you form an entity and you get a year or two down the line and you go into uh, you go into market and and somebody smacks you with a cease and desist letter uh, that that you've got to stop using uh, their name um, so that's that's uh, what I wanted to tell you about kind of the naming uh, process we could go into a lot of depth but but I, I'd rather um, hit the next one. Uh, I mean, just uh, sorry, real quick, uh, just for everybody that's calling in, there's a few folks. Uh, if you want to get in online, um, we, we do have a Q&A function. And for those of you online already see some questions coming in, please do ask the questions in the Q&A function and we will touch those on at the end here. And, and Vitaly, please interrupt me because I'm on full screen and can't see them right now, uh, those, those questions. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you to interrupt me. Um, you know, I, the, the next topic I wanted to hit is, is, you know, the founder roles and responsibilities and, and really the, the partition of the cap table. And, and what I see happening a lot are, are people coming in and out. So, you know, three friends come up with the idea for a company and they spend a lot of time on it. Um, maybe one of, the, one of them spends more time than the others. And, and over time, what started out as a one third, one third, one third um, evolves into something else or one of them takes a job. Uh, or uh, one of them is actually already working for a big company and has signed a confidential uh, information and proprietary invention assignment agreement. And there's a question mark at that point if what you're creating doesn't belong to uh, the company that that person uh, works for. So it's really important 
to agree at the outset and document who's doing what, um, what, what is going to be the capital and who, who's responsible for what and, and when people are going to leave their, their jobs. If you're working at another company, it's really important that you keep separation of devices, uh, separation of email, and that there isn't any leakage from your primary work uh, devices to your new startup devices, and that whatever your, your work you're doing on your your new startup is is done uh, on nights and weekends, and it is not, uh, and you're not using um, the resources of your primary employer uh, for that um, for that job. Um, Typically, a, a venture firm, when they come in, and, and or even an angel, and they give, you know, let's say they write a million dollar check, they're going to want to make sure that the founders are going to still be there uh, in a year, two years, three years down the line, as really uh, every startup is an investment, not only into a business idea, uh, not only into intellectual property, but it's people, people that can implement the intellectual property and can monetize a business model. And so they're going to ask the founders to agree to be subject to vesting. And that means that um, they're going to want the founders not to own a third of the company, uh, but that they would have to vest into it. And typically that vesting has a one year cliff so that if anybody leaves in the first year, they lose everything. Um, after one year, one fourth of their of their holding is going to be vested and then it's going to vest thereafter on either a monthly, quarterly or, or annual basis. And I'm, I, you know, the, the, the four year vesting with a one year cliff has been ubiquitous in Silicon Valley startups for years. And I'm starting to see an interesting trend where uh, some founder groups get together and they say, you know what, um, let's take risk off the table that somebody leaves. Let's all go in with like a two year vest a two year cliff. Um, and, and so that, you know, everybody knows that everybody's all the way in, um, it, it, in interesting times, uh, uh, you see interesting things. Um, so the idea here is that if you leave, uh, before you're vested, you lose your stock and so that you could be replaced, uh, and there would still be enough, uh, common stock in the pool for somebody to come in and be incentivized. Um, so that's what I wanted to share with you about founder roles and, and responsibility. Um, you know, next I wanted to talk about IP strategy. And um, I think there's been a movement in the last couple of years of, oh, you know, I don't need patents. Patents have no value anymore in this new economy. It's all about trade secrets. Um, it, it's all about, um, uh, you know, my, my secret sauce or, or um, you know, my, my team's ability to implement that idea. And you know, Groupon might be a, a, some sort of an example of, it's not about the technology, it's about you know, blanketing the market with the product that, that you can put into the market so quickly that nobody else can ever catch up to you. And you know, for some e-commerce type of companies, maybe that is the right strategy. But for many tech companies, you really want to spend some time at the outset to evaluate, you know, what is the patentability of your idea. And if you're able to um, uh, write a patent and get patent protection, you're really going to put a perimeter of protection um, and, and competitive barriers to entry around your business model that can last for 10 to 20 years. And, and if you invest a lot, it can, it can go into other countries and, and even be global in, in scope. And you really want to spend some time uh, talking about what is your strategy? Is it patentable? Uh, is it going to be a trademark that you're going to need? Um, if, if, it, if you are going to rely on trade secrets, what is it that you're going to do to um, make sure that your uh, trade secrets are indeed protected? And, and so, you know, the, end, the, the mutual NDA is, is one way of of doing that, uh, but it's also you know just making sure that there's a very tight group of people that that have access to your code and and that um, every person that's touched that code has signed a proprietary invention assignment agreement. So there is no question that the code or the the technology that's been developed belongs to the company and not to the individual or their other uh, employers. Um, so that's what I wanted to um, Maybe share. I can add a little bit to this as well. Uh, this is a very common question that I get when companies are looking to fundraise. 
where uh, they should be investing in patents and developing IP. And uh, there's, they get a lot of conflicting advice on this. Uh, usually that, you know, some people say, oh, patents aren't worth it. They're unenforceable. You're not going to have money to take somebody to court as a startup. All those things are true that you won't. But when the company is raising capital, um, you want to show progress. You want to show that uh, you're developing some technology, right? We're, we're past the days, you know, for, for a number of years, we are really kind of over-focused on traction and like launching a mobile app and just having X number of users. And there's really not much IP, all the values and the traction and the marketing aspects. We're now getting back to an era where we're getting into hard tech. And if you look at all the venture capital trends, we're getting into things where they are patentable. It is actual invention being commercialized. So all those things are becoming important again. And it's uh, at the earliest stages when you talk about seed, series A, when you don't have 20,000, 40,000 times each patent and, and all the time in the world to get this done, you still have to have a strategy of how you're going to protect your IP long-term, how are you going to build value? And at the end, it's an asset that is a big part of the value in your company. So really pay attention to that, talk to your lawyers and figure out the long-term strategy, not kind of a checklist that you do very early on. There are certain things that are kind of high priority at, at the very early stages, but this is something that you need to really pay attention to, especially if you're in a highly technical field. So I just wanted to add that because that's a common question that comes up. Yeah, Vitaly, I'm gonna follow up on that. You know, you help a lot of companies raise money and, 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 and sell. And I, I'm curious as to your evaluation of a, of, a, of a company's IP when you see that they have two or three issued patents versus a company that um, says no patents, we're, we're all trade secrets. Do you, do you think that that has much impact on, on the mi mindset and the valuation of a startup either at fundraise or at exit? It's, it's a tricky one, right? So we do work with companies, for example, in electric mobility and uh, development in that sector is so fast that, you know, the, this four year patent uh, timeline just doesn't really line up because the technology gets stale very quickly. Uh, so in that case, a lot of companies do have kind of secret sauce and they have a strategy for that. But when it comes time, especially for M&A, when you're selling a company, the question is, what are you selling? And if you have a bunch of IP, a bunch of patents and things that are part of the package, you can put some kind of number on this. But if you have some the descript vague descriptions of IP and no strategy, it makes it much more difficult. Uh, when you're raising capital, it's a slightly different conversation. It's more about how big is the market? What's your strategy to get to the market? Show me proof points that the customers are buying this product. Uh, and it's not so much about, you know, sell me your patents uh, kind of idea. But M&A is a different story, absolutely. Yeah, and I would say that um, it's it's really the best evidence that you can demonstrate that there are competitive barriers to entry uh, from a legal perspective, and so that's where I find uh, that it that it has an enormous amount of value. And I want to tell all of the startups out there that once you're at um, you know Series C and beyond, um, your investors are going to be insisting that you are. Um, writing patents and protecting your IP and, and you'll have a very developed uh, program. So uh, thinking about it at the outset, I, I really think um, is, is part of uh, what makes uh, a successful um, startup. You know, one last thing I want to talk about, which is kind of on the edges of IP is um, I'm seeing a lot of companies uh, running into trouble with, uh, with their social media um, where, you know, you, you might have six or seven and then suddenly you have 10 and then 20 uh, people that you're collaborating with. And, and uh, you know, they post all sorts of things about what the company's doing to, you know, continue with the buzz. And you really need to be careful about what is put out into the public domain uh, on, on any channel, but but especially social media, which is the the most public channel that you could find. And, and so um, it's it's important to adopt a social media policy and make sure that it's very clear who within the company is allowed to post, and that that person uh, is is extremely careful and thoughtful that they're integrating the IP strategy into whatever it is that they're posting and that they're not, um, in fact, ruining the IP strategy by putting out into the public domain uh, things on, on social media. So just a, a short plug on that uh, before we move yeah, on. Just, uh, before we move on, there's actually a good question we should probably answer in context, uh, the value of provisional versus full patent applications. Uh, do you want to touch on that real quick? 
Um, well, if it's a value question, I'm, I, I think it's a great question for you to answer, but I will say from a legal perspective that, you know, your protection uh, starts at the moment that you file a provisional and it's first to, to file that provisional that, that's going to matter. Um, so that it, 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 it really is uh, something that's important. Natalie? Yeah, I mean, the difference really is the uh, first to file is, is a big aspect here and provisional, you know, you can put together provisional patent over the weekend. Um, and in a lot of cases, you can write it up yourself, but um, the full patent is going to take you several years to attain. And certainly that has a lot more value because that's a confirmation that you can actually own this IP. Uh, whereas a provisional is just, it's just a, a bookmark, let's say. Um, right. And, and, and I want to add on that, that once you file the provisional, you have one year within which to file the patent, the full patent application. Uh, and so you're gonna to need to know that the clock starts ticking once you file that provisional. And if you don't raise the funds that are gonna be needed to write that patent, uh, you know, you, you, you have, you're gonna have a problem. And so you, you need to make sure that, you know, from the moment that you file that provisional that you're very aware of the, of the, of the clock. Um, there's also elements of, of where you file. So there's the, what's called the PCT, the patent corporation treaty, which allows you to file, for example, a patent in the U S and then be able to extend that one year filing into all the countries that are in the treaty, which include all the, all the biggest countries in the world, all the biggest markets. So you should definitely be talking with patent lawyers. If you're developing hard tech, um, and that's a big part of your business, uh, reach out to us. Um, you know, we can certainly get you more specific advice and, and put you on the right track. Thanks Vitaly. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm now going to hit a subject that's near and dear to your heart, which is, um, you know, raising capital. And, and um, I, I'm happy for you to talk about, you know, what you think are the best tools to, uh, to use to raise capital, but whatever tool you're using, whether it's a convertible note, a safe, uh, a, a, a series of seed, preferred stock or, or um, series seed or series zero, whatever it is, even common stock, whether you're selling to your grandma uh, or your aunt or uncle, the federal and state securities laws are going to apply and you need to make sure that council has looked at the documents uh, that you're using and that they uh, will protect you it going forward. Um, I, I can't tell you the number of startups that I have seen uh, blow up because of securities laws violations. And you know, no venture capital firm is going to put money into an entity uh, that is that has a mess written all over it. And and you know, if you've if you've made a mess, a lot of the times it can be cleaned up. Uh, but some some of these uh, are going to require you to form a whole new entity and start over, um, which again will have negative tax impacts. Um, Natalia, let's chat a minute about um, what people are using these days to, to raise capital. Yeah, I mean, first of all, let me kind of step back and explain a little bit because I found that something like 90% of entrepreneurs or more uh, don't actually understand securities laws and what you can and cannot do when you raise capital. Uh, obviously, you're out there desperate to get that first money in the door and you will try to get everybody to invest. You'll figure out, you'll download some, some you know, safe contract off the YC website or find a convertible note PDF somewhere and, and try to do it yourself. This is, uh, you know, when things go well, uh, those kind of things kind of get swept under the rug, but when they don't, and most times startups will at the very least go two steps forward, one step back many, many times, you're asking for big, big trouble. And when you have advisors who are not registered, FINRA registered broker dealers out there pitching your company, um, you know, this is, this is a topic near and dear. I am a registered broker dealer. This is very important. It's, it's much like, it's a little bit beyond a stockbroker uh, license and uh, something that SEC and FINRA kind of oversee uh, quite a bit. And we are in the most regulated industry there is, the financial industry. When you're out there raising money on your own, um, you as a shareholder, as a founder, you have certain rights, you can talk about the company, but if you have agents, you have people out there that are advisors that are out there pitching the company and in return asking for a percentage of the money that they raise, which is quite common, um, and they're not registered, they are doing something that, you know, clear as day is really illegal. And the recourse is that that investor, that individual that they pitched and, and got to invest in your company, they can come back virtually at any time and ask for their money back. 
uh, which could be a big, big problem. This is what Louis is talking about when you have this cap table with a bunch of really fuzzy unknown angels and you don't know if they're accredited or not and things just weren't followed properly. Um, VCs when doing due diligence will really start digging into this and this could be a huge problem. So, um, you know, this is something that for some reason, most founders don't know unless they've worked in the financial industry. Um, this is something that you need to really pay attention to. And if you have any advisors that are raising capital for you, they must be broker dealers. They must be professionals in raising capital, follow all the laws, all the rules and, and go from there. So, so that's, that's the very important piece. As far as structures, uh, certainly there are convertible notes and safes. There's equity. Um, at the very early stages, I almost always find myself uh, suggesting to do a safe wh where the, you know, the difference in convertible note and safe is, is really that convertible note is kind of a, a hybrid instrument that was before, you know, let's say a decade ago was used for uh, kind of uh, a round in between rounds where you know you have a certain amount of time, some gap that you need to fill and your existing investors might invest and it's really debt to the company. But that somehow uh, morphed into being used for virtually 90% or more of the early stage rounds because it's a very simple way to organize. You, know, it's, you don't have to argue about valuation. It's a five page little document. Everybody can sign off on it and go on with their life and spend a, little, you know, a lot less on uh, time and resources on structuring the round. Uh, so that has been really uh, picked up. I think a lot of accelerators, including Y Combinator, really pushed that. Uh, then Y Combinator, um, along with Wilson Sonsini, back, I don't know how many years ago now, created the SAFE, which is essentially the same thing, except it's something that doesn't term out. It doesn't have a specific term of 12, 18, or 24 months, and it doesn't carry interest. It just simply converts with a discount or a cap or both into the next round of financing. Um, and then, of course, there's the full equity round. So, um, you know, the numbers have been kind of inflated the last few years before you might raise up to a million on a convertible note or safe and then go to equity. Now you see really large uh, convertible notes and saves into the tens of millions sometimes. Uh, so these things tend to fluctuate. We'll see what happens now with uh, the environment changing. Uh, but a lot of early investors don't like this because they don't, you know, they don't have any downside protection. They don't have equity in the company. It's just kind of a, a debt instrument. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really going to depend on who you're talking to, but my advice to the entrepreneurs on the call is obviously be flexible and, and follow the lead and get good counsel to make sure that you're not putting yourself in trouble or at risk or signing something that you might not understand the ramifications of, uh, down in the future. And I'm going to add to that, Vitaly is, um, I, I see, uh, investors getting themselves into pickles frequently uh, by having varying terms in their convertible notes or uh, varying terms in their safes and, and different caps on con value on, upon conversion, different interest rates, different maturity dates. And uh, I, I find that that can be, uh, you know, very challenging and confusing and, and send the wrong messaging. So it, it used to be that you could say that East Coast investors probably wouldn't invest in a safe. Therefore, if you thought that you were gonna be raising money from folks on the East Coast, you should probably just stick with a convertible note and you know, other founder friendly terms like a two year maturity date, a 2% interest rate, uh, no security and, and a, uh, a low discount uh, upon conversion. Um, I think that the safe is really becoming ubiquitous, not only in the U.S. but all over the world. Um, but but uh, you know there there are going to be some people out there that are going to insist on a convertible note. And if you know that you're dealing with a sophisticated investor that is 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 like that, then you're going to probably want to start and use the same paper for everyone and and convertible notes throughout. Um, so those are my those are my thoughts on, on that topic, and 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 really it, it has big consequences on conversion when you do raise equity if you've got all of these different mm -hmm. instruments with different terms uh, because everybody's going to suddenly see uh, you know what they got and and your you as the founder are going to be diluted in different ways according to the security that you've raised. Okay, I'm going to stop there because uh, we could talk for hours about uh, this topic, especially with uh, Vitaly on the line. Um, I, I want to then uh, quickly get through these legal topics so we can give hand it over to Jenny to talk about accounting. But um, I would say that upon fundraising and especially upon exit, 
where founders get dinged the most is on failure to comply with employment laws. So it always starts out that everybody's a 1099 consultant, um, nobody's getting paid any cash, and when a buyer or a venture firm comes in and looks at it, they, they do their due diligence and they say, well, geez, this guy is the CFO. Uh, how could this guy be a consultant? Uh, that doesn't make sense. So that person was uh, misclassified uh, for two years. Go back, please you know, pay the payroll taxes blah, blah, blah. And, and if, if your startup does this for a number of years with a, a large population of people, you know, the amount of penalties can be significant. Um, and so what I would tell you is, is once again, um, you know, creative counsel can help you, uh, you know, do 10, 1099s for as long as is prudent, but there, there is a time where you, you really need to flip the switch. Um, there's also been a development in California uh, in the last year. They passed a statute called AB5 in response to the whole gig economy and, and folks working for, for the big uh, 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 ride-sharing companies and other on-demand companies in this on-demand economy where uh, the, the statute now says these people need to be given benefits and treated as if they were employees because you know, all their whole life is controlled by, you know, their, their one uh, person that's paying their paycheck and, and thus they aren't consultants, they're, they're, they're really employees. And, and so that's another element uh, that you've got to pay attention to if you're in the state of California. Um, benefits and equity plans should be adopted at formation. Uh, typically, you're going to adopt a plan that's very flexible that will set aside 10 to 20% of the common stock uh, in a pool that's going to be available for incentivizing uh, your the population of people and talent you're going to need to recruit, incentivize, and and retain. Um, and there there are a whole series of rules that are in place to make sure that those are taxed appropriately. And so if you have any stock that's subject to vesting, uh, you're going to have to file what's called an 83B document with the IRS within 30 days of stock issuance. Um, and if you're um, uh, issuing options, you're going to want to make sure that you have a third party valuation as to what the, the, the price of the, of the stock should be and that, that it's actually being priced at fair market value and not at a discount, um, absent which you've got cheap stock problems, accounting problems, uh, and, and the employees and the employer have uh, uh, penalties. Um, so that's, that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, a word about compliance. There's there's just a lot of uh, different ways that uh, we see companies getting in trouble, and and so prophylactically, um, good counsel is going to ask you not only to adopt a, a social media policy, but a data collection policy, an online and other mobile uh, activity policy to make sure that you know people know the rules of the road and and not to get into trouble. Um, uh, one of your initial indicia of success is going to be your ability to, to bring in revenue uh, from customers. You're going to need uh, potentially suppliers to help support that revenue and, and making sure that your contracts are documented, stored in a, in a central repository that you know when they're coming up uh, for renewal or expiration. Um, if, if a license is, is expired, you know, you've got to renew it. Otherwise, um, you, you may not uh, have the right to, to be using it going forward. So um, a good counsel is going to help you make sure that you have a process to document all of this, because if, if you don't have uh, uh, your customers papered, maybe you don't have revenue at all. And uh, I find increasingly that a company's ability to raise a series A and certainly a series B is very, very dependent on your ability to document not only that you have revenue, but that it's uh, recurring revenue. And now I'm, I'm uh, veering off into my friend Jenny's uh, uh, bailiwick and, and Jenny, I wanted to hand it over to you to talk about how startups should get set up properly so that they have a finance and accounting function uh, that is you know, appropriate for their stage of growth and, and yet protects them from getting into trouble. Yeah, thank you, Louis. Thank you so much. So I will talk about finance briefly at a very high level because there is a, a great deal of um, flexibility 
depending on which stage you're on or how much growth you're projecting or how complex your business can be. Not so long ago, um, I started the private companies. I've seen mostly US centric companies. You know, it's a very specific to a location. You know, their customers, the vendors are very one country centric. And that trend has changed. I've seen more companies now that they start off maybe one location, but very, very immediately after that they would launch international entities. So multi-location. That brings another layer of complexity to be compliance with the international different regulations and laws or complexity in, you know, just how do I pay these people? We have contractors which work as engineers in Russia, Eastern Europe, Brazil. How do I accommodate all different ones and comply with each country's labor um, law? Just Louis mentioned uh, not so long ago. So given all these competing priorities, so as a founder, as a CEO, as a person running a company and be responsible for that operation, you need to think about how am I going to set my operations so that I can really focus on what's important to grow the business and at the same time, I can set the foundation for scalable operation down the road. So I will talk about those. Um, and then I will start with uh, what does finance do for you? So the next slide. Do I? Uh, yeah. So finance, um, you know, a lot of companies, especially early stage entrepreneurs, will come to me saying, I have my bank account. What else I need? I don't really need a finance professional. And it's fairly pricey. So I would typically respond in a very high level uh, way. One is what does finance do for you? One is we keep the company and you out of trouble. So that can mean multiple different things. So for one, you need to file taxes. So for that, you need to have very accurate, clean financials. How much time you spend and how you pay your employees and how they um, classify them, just like Louis mentioned, you classify them as 1099 contractors or W-2 wage earners. So those things we help you. And there are many different types of compliance documents. You know, for a private company, there is a blue sky law that you have to file 498 on an annual basis. That will set your valuation price. So those things we need to check off. You know, so we talked about stock option keeping the documents clean. You know, angel investor, they put down a small amount of money, but a very high valuation, right, for now. So do I have all the documentation ready? So finance will be the organization that you turn to as a single source of truth. So those financials being clean and keep the company out of trouble. Then I'll go to the next slide, which is being a really a business partner. So we check off, you know, we file taxes, we got the minimum compliance done. Now what, right? I have the financials, I can see the books, you know, how much money I'm making, how much money I'm spending, and I have somewhat good hands around, um, around my stock administration and cap table. So the third level, which is the highest level, which is, you know, the most fun part of finance professionals is to be your business partner. So a lot of times I've seen CFOs being a COO, or COO is wearing the hat of a CFO. So what that is, is I'm helping you CEO that you can really see what's happening. If these are just a financial numbers that do not convey a lot of information for you, it's not very helpful, but I'm running a business. Let's say um, I'm running a SaaS company, but I want to see how many customers signed up, where do walk in, how do they learn about us, how much are they paying, and what channels are they using and what product they're signing? You know, which year they signed up and which location. And if I change the price, their behavior changes. I want to see all of that. And where can I see that? You know, in SaaS world, we throw things around, you know, terminology, ARR, MRR, ending ARR, you know, CAC, and LTV, you name it. So finance team will put together the metrics or the dashboard for you so that you can see Oh, you know, in one snapshot, I can see how things are working. I can see how much money is flowing in, how much am I spending in sales or marketing. And going forward basis, I can see how much I need to think about. And from this round to next round, it's a sprint 
I can see what I need to spend to get to the next level. So that is really the value add to bring the visibility into the operation. So then you pause for a second. Oh my God, you know, like Vitaly and Louis told me I have to do a lot of different things, you know, provisional uh, pattern spending. I have to keep the documents clean, uh, compiling tax returns. There's a lot going on. And I also need to grow my business, grow my top line. I need to um, have meetings with investors and customers and vendors. This is a lot. And I only have 24 hours and I have very small number of people that I can turn to. So what do you do? So there are many, many great tools out there that you can take advantage of. You don't really need to do all this manually. And obviously there are, you know, front end revenue operations tools that you can use for finance operations. It's almost like a playbook. And you can see a lot of people use the common tools. You know, for early stage companies, I have seen people using QuickBooks quite extensively. And sometimes they have that innate apps inside uh, their software. So payroll is in there. Um, sometimes you don't need to sign up for another payroll. It's all in your CRM or ERP tools. Um, next week, if it's more advanced, and if you want to start thinking about my people are flying and I want to track their expenses, there's Expensify or other banking tools that you can use. And AP side, accounts payable side, I need to pay vendors. I'm not, you don't need to track them in uh, Excel or check your banking records every five minutes, or you don't need to put out the fire because your vendors are very angry that you can get paid. You can use a tool. There are many tools out there, AP platform tools, bill.com or Tipalti, you name it. And you, know, you can use those um, and connect them so that you have the full visibility and control. And you can see the banking operation and cash movements on a daily basis. So Jenny, I'm going to put you on the spot because this is a really fun question. And I get it frequently uh, from, from founders. Um, or, or, you know, what are the tools that they should put in place right away? What are the kind of the best in class apps and resources? Um, let's say you've just gotten a million dollar seed check and you have four people that are employees. You know, what would be your accounting system? Is it going to be QuickBooks or are you going to go with some, something else? Yeah, I mean, I'm expressing my personal opinion here. It's almost like a startup toolkit, so to speak. Yeah. It's like a startup kit, right? You have to do something. I'm going to do gardening and what should I use, right? Don't right. make me, you can go research. So for your general bookkeeping, I find QuickBooks the most extensive use and very flexible. Okay. Um, QuickBooks comes with a payroll and I, I saw the advertisement there uh, reducing the prices. So it's really good. So you put that on there and even it's very self-explanatory so you can even use it yourself. So yeah. now, you need, yes, QuickBooks has an AP, like vendor management side, and you can also set it up bill.com. And bill.com is SMB specific uh, tool that you can force it out. Now, expensive by credit cards, uh, managing the budget, what else should you think about? Expensive by is a pretty good, but if you don't want to pay expensive by seats, you can limp along with the uh, credit cards or even there is a credit card, they do not charge you fees, but they give you all the you know, bells and whistles, the features. It's like a, a card called Divi, D-I-V-V-Y, and there are many tools out there. So if you have those, you know, three or four set up, you're good to go. You don't need to worry about it. All the records reside in situ, right? And you have full visibility. Tools are connected to your banking system, to your business checking accounts, all that is good. So on the other side, how about my equity? Equity, I do my cap table in the spreadsheet. Is that good? Like, no, not really. And if you rely on a law firm, the legal bill can be very high. So yeah. I advise my clients from the get-go, spend some time, time, not so much money, uh, set up something really easy to use, such as Carter, right? Then you can see everyone's, and you kind of develop a process or rhythm to, oh, this is an issue. Um, I can even collect the money from employees who want to exercise their options. In the past, I literally have to receive the checks or giving them the banking wire instructions. Now it's all set in as an ACH. 
residing in Kata. So you can transact through Kata as well. So if you get those three, four tools done, you're good to go. How about Banker? Um, which banks do you think are the easiest for startups to work with? Um, I can speak to the Silicon Valley. I mean, the vast majority I've seen Silicon Valley Bank, right? And I have seen the First Republic Bank and, you know, Comerica, you know, they're all wonderful banks, you know, PacWest. And to an extent, some people start using Chase, you know, Bank of America. So more commercial banks as well. So yeah, I want to add First Republic and Square One to that list of, of people yeah. that are really trying to help right. startups. Yeah. So one yeah. thing I'll add to that, that I think that comes up quite a bit um, with our practice is uh, foreign companies uh, have a lot of trouble getting bank accounts. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank has been kind of difficult, I hate to say it, um, with them. Uh, others have been a little bit easier. Uh, they're looking for you know, a certain amount of deposit, but there's also anti-money laundering mm -hmm. uh, checks that they have to go through uh, for foreigner-owned bank accounts. It's trickier. Um, and all sorts of Patriot Act, uh, things that, that commercial banks have to go through as investment banks, but we don't take deposits. So I'll add to that. I'm going to invite you both to take some shots on lawyers um, <laughs> uh, and, and talk about legal tools. And I think Carta is a great tool. I put all of my startups onto Carta right away. Uh, and my own philosophy is that anything that uh, a robot can do, uh, we shouldn't have humans doing because you know that's going to be a waste of resources. Um, I think we've all heard that uh, of Atrium. There was a there was a an initiative by the venture capital firms of Silicon Valley to create a subscription as a service uh, platform for startups to get legal service they needed, and it was called Atrium, and it recently uh, dissolved. And uh, so it was a, a great experiment, which, which failed. And so I think we're back to um, finding specific tools uh, that can serve specific purposes, Carta being the one that we're using for managing the cap table. But um, I, would, I would ask you both, what other you know, legal tools are you seeing um, that, that are you know, helpful in managing cost uh, and keeping expense down? Um, of course, in addition to L2 Council. <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll say that uh, the best way to save money on legal is to not sweep it under the rug and go into crisis mode later. Uh, plan ahead. It's going to come up. Just know this. It's going to come up. Put money aside. Do it properly. Talk to counsel early. Every situation is different. It is not something that can be automated. Carta, you know, what they automate is you know, kind of more mechanical things like issuing papers, stock certificates, and sending them out. Uh, or keeping things in an Excel spreadsheet, super convenient. Um, but when you're talking about structuring a deal, structuring the company, dealing with IP issues, all those things are so custom that, um, that you know, there's no way to automate those tools. You know, the best tool is just pay attention to this and prioritize it early on. You know, I know, I can tell you as an entrepreneur first for many, many years of my own companies, you know, uh, getting organized and, get, and keeping things clean can be a last priority when you're busy trying to get customers, building products, sleeping under your desk with the engineering team and trying to figure all these things out. Um, yes, you have a lot of things to do, but you are running a business first and foremost. Businesses exist in a legal framework, in a financial framework. You need to pay attention to that, especially if you're not a business person, not a finance person by training, but an engineer get good help early on and make sure that everything is set up properly and clean. Just like you have tech debt, if you're, if you're writing messy code, the legal debt and the actual debt your company will incur if you violate laws, uh, especially employment laws. By the way, employment laws are very, very strict. If you think that everything is under the company, you'll be surprised to know that uh, even if you dissolve the company and you owe payroll taxes or you owe salaries, all that is going to follow you personally, even in the US. So um, I cannot stress it enough that you need to be prepared from day one and know that you're running a business. Yeah, I can only echo that. I have seen, you know, I help companies with the due diligence and due diligence can be uh, initial stage where they're raising uh, equity or debt or due diligence at the transaction level exit event, right? And I have seen at both points in time that a lot of things get into a question, right? So for instance, labor law is very, very common, um, even patent. 
sometimes I've seen companies, a patent was under a founder or early uh, founding member's name. The person leaves, take the patent with him, literally, and without really thinking about it. So uh, all these little things are very critical and just strictly legal uh, side, right? There are tools, you know, we have seen, I have seen LegalZoom, you know, all these other tools that are very widely uh, used for a smaller scale, like LLC set up and whatnot. But just like Vitaly said, it is a good money spent if you invest in legal documents and structure solid with a really good counsel, and then you're good to go. It's just more like a one-time setup fee, so to speak, right? And, but you don't need to worry about it because the, the framework is done. You can build a house, you can change interior design, you can change, um, put lamps in it and gardening, that you can all do. But the fundamental structure needs to be done by professional. It's not something that you can um, walk around. Then you, you will pay the price if you did it incorrectly, right? The house will collapse at, at the end of the day or the basement will go away, right? So things will happen and it is at a larger scale. One thing that we didn't talk about throughout this presentation is the insurance. So Vitaly mentioned, you know, there's a personal liability associated with it, especially in lieu of labor law, which is very true. But how do you mitigate that? You know, you can't just thinking about it and be fearful about it, then you cannot really focus on business. So you should be able to focus on business. And there are many good insurance companies and advisors, they will do that for you. There are specific packages, you know, we typically talk about DNO policy, directors and officers policy to protect you, right? So those things are all available and you just need to reach out and understand what those means and just implement in your day-to-day -day life. Um, uh, thank you so much, Jenny. And, and um, I, I know we all have our favorite tools and I think that could be the subject of its own webinar, uh, our favorite uh, technology tools. Um, I, I just wanted to echo that I think that legal technology tools are absolutely valid and helpful. I just think that they should be used in close cooperation with your lawyer. You should have a lawyer that's that embraces technology. Um, so for example, I, I subscribe to a number of databases that gives me forms of contracts. Um, those are always great forms to start from, but they need some tailoring. And the, the first step of tailoring might need to be done by the entrepreneur to give me, for example, what does the scope of work with the customer look like? And then I can then iterate it from there. Uh, but technology should be integrated into your, all of your legal solutions so that you're, you're spending as little as possible uh, on lawyers, which is still going to be a, a significant amount. And, and working with, with lawyers and, and other advisors that embrace technology really are, are key to, to success. And we could talk all day and night about some of those tools and and uh, and and spend another hour. But um, while we have everyone in the line, Vitaly, I was thinking that it might be we should go hit the Q and A at this point. Yeah, actually, I was just about to say um, I'm I'm looking at the questions here, and there's there's a couple that I want to get out of the way quickly so we can dive into the deeper ones. Uh, there was a set of questions about S corps versus C corps. S corp S corp stands for Small Business Corporation. And it's uh, the tax treatment is much like an LLC. You pass through any kind of losses or gains for that year uh, to the owners by percentage. The, um, that might be good initially for you and your angel investors if you're running a small business. But if you're running a C Corp, uh, I mean, to go public, you have to be a C Corp, which has its, pays its own taxes and then pays out the dividends and everybody pays their own taxes on top of that. And what that means, if you're running as a C Corp from day one, all the losses, all the negative that you're accumulating for the first few years, that gets passed through and is a tax deduction, let's say, a few years down the road when you do start showing profit. So your investors are going to want to see that. Also, the, you know, it's a deeper topic, something we can hit offline and something uh, Louis could probably explain in, in detail to anybody that has this question. And Two problems sure. with the S Corp. One is it's a pass through. So your, your investors, any, any professional money is not going to want it. Number two is it doesn't allow for diversity of citizenship. So you, everybody has to be uh, resident in the same state. So for a Delaware S Corp, everybody has to be resident in Delaware. So here in the Silicon Valley, people using S Corps have to use California as their jurisdiction, which I think is, is, uh, um, 
replete with uh, with danger. I, I avoid California where, wherever I can. Um, so an, an S corp, I think, is is great for a lifestyle business, a family run business, a restaurant, uh, but not for a business that's going to use that you're going to use to raise capital. Uh, also, a question about uh, the different states. Uh, maybe you can hit in 15, 20 seconds why Delaware and not nothing else. Yeah, Delaware is a, has a very uh, complex and well-written uh, set of uh, statutes, rules, and regulations that are designed to encourage business. And then it has a judiciary that uh, uh, that, that resolves disputes so that businesses uh, can continue. Other states get, have politicized judiciaries uh, and are, are who, who have judiciaries that you have no idea how they will interpret any, any sort of rule. And then you have um, states that implement rules for political reasons. Uh, Delaware's sole uh, political purpose is to attra attract and retain uh, business. I, I think Nevada is another state that has tried to do that. Um, and, and is having increasing success. I saw there was a question about whether Nevada is, is an okay place. Um, I, I think uh, it's, it's, it's second to Delaware. If you're a Nevada corporation and you're looking to raise capital, your venture firm is very likely to tell you to reincorporate in, in Delaware. So I, I generally avoid it uh, and go straight to Delaware. Colleen has a related question about B Corps. What Great question. Um, B Corps have a public uh, benefit uh, that they are designed to try and um, uh, advance. And, um, you know, they're, they're increasingly uh, used and uh, I, I don't see a, a, a terrible amount of downsides. I think they're a great tool, but prob probably the subject of another webinar. Yeah, and uh, from an investor perspective, uh, as a B Corp, you know, we all want to do the right thing. Uh, one thing that I, that I like to say that I heard once is uh, do well, then do good. That's the general approach of investors. Um, so there are very few investors that are quote unquote impact investors and are specifically looking for B Corps, um, but it's a very small minority. So unless you're really in that space, uh, don't, don't try to uh, over-engineer yourself into that direction, especially early on. Um, let's see, other questions, um, maybe for Jenny, uh, how important is the owner's credit scores to starting a company and obtaining capital? Uh, that's an interesting one. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I can speak, maybe Vitaly, you can chime in as well. Um, so many, you know, VC funds or, you know, PEs, they, they do due diligence differently. But one thing that I've seen in common is a part of the due diligence is Yes, it's on technology, on the space, on the team, but the team side, uh, you know, like the founders, not only their kind of how you have done career-wise, a good track record, you know, you can build a team, etc. It's also on the, you know, there is a, you know, just due diligence on that person as well. To date, I haven't seen anyone uh, because of the credit score, we didn't do it. I haven't seen that. Uh, yet, do you guys have have you guys seen those? Yeah, well, let me just address it from a different angle. I think that uh, professional investors always do a background check, and they don't do a deep background check. They're not sending you know a private eye to your house. It, it, they're using a, a, a scalable platform like VCheck Global. I use them frequently, and I think it's a great solution. Um, and you know, they're going to basically pick off the internet everything anything that's findable. Um, which generally doesn't include uh, as detailed of a, of a report as a credit evaluation, but it will pick up uh, traffic tickets, divorces, mortgages, and importantly, bankruptcies and tax liens. Um, and so that's typically what I, those are the typical red flags that, that I see in my VCheck reports. Yeah, I can tell you as a former VC, um, this the corporate VC at HP uh, a few years back, um, I can say that this this does come up in a certain, you know, for me, it comes up to kind of understand the character of the founders. You know, if if they can take of their care of their personal credit, you know, with some exceptions that they can't control, you know, how good will they be uh, looking after the company and after the finances of the company, especially if they're first time entrepreneur with no track record. If they're kind of a personal mess, that's going to tell you a little bit about how they're going to run the company as well. So it's something to pay attention to. 
Um, in the financial industry, you're going to find a lot more uh, scrutiny on a kind of personal level and background checks when something's sensitive, when you're a fiduciary. Um, but uh, just purely founder at the seed stage, for example, that's not something you necessarily have to worry about. Vitaly, would you guys run credit checks? I, I shouldn't ask you about HP Tech Ventures because you probably can't talk about that. But do you find that investors are actually running personal credit checks on founders? I don't. I see the V-Check report. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't done it myself. Um, our due diligence checklist was like something like 130 points, but it was more about the company and, um, and certain things. But, uh, you know, you do want to understand who you're dealing with, who the management is, who is controlling the company. But I haven't, I've heard of it, but I haven't seen a lot of uh, credit checks or kind of specific things digging in like that. Right. Next question. Yep. Um, also, just quick questions about, I, I think there's a number of questions about kind of coming out to commercial banking. Uh, what's the benefit of somebody like SVB? I'll answer it. I'll try to answer it quickly. Um, really, the difference between somebody specialized like SVB or, or, um, or First Republic or Square One is that, you know, later down the road when you need things like venture debt, uh, you know, they understand startups better. They understand the different financial instruments. It's, if it's just a deposit where you put your, ch where you put your money and where you issue payroll from, it doesn't matter that much. But it's later when that relationship becomes more interesting and you need some, some more advanced things. Maybe Jenny can add to that. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. That is the, the clear benefit. And they're very flexible. And one thing I would mention that as dry as it may sound, having a relationship with your banker, it is very important. Just like anything else, having a relationship with Louis as a, a, an attorney or investor, it is very important to have a good relationship. You never know they can help you. And also the second point, while I was helping a lot of people going through SBA or PPP loan process, having a, a diverse, not just one, let's say you have a main banker, main deposit account with one credit union or SVB or First Republic or Square, right? It's always good to build credit history or somebody else with another bank as well. It doesn't need to be your main, but the secondary, good to kind of, you know, check, right? Like, hey, what's going on? How's the market? Am I doing it right? Or can you give me, a, can I, I was thinking of opening a credit card is the right thing to do. It's just a one more thing to do, but think of it as an investment in relationship building. So these people can help you down the road in venture financing debt or anything you may need down the road. I think that's a great point about relationships. And, and I think that's a really interesting point you made about having two. I think there's not enough time in the world for us to have relationships with everybody, but having one primary and maybe a secondary is a good idea. What about credit unions? Are, are you seeing credit unions as a good um, uh, source of, of banking for startups, Jenny? I haven't seen that many. It's more of a kind of LLC, you know, private um, setup that I've seen, even, you know, to an extent escort we talked about, right? Just a pass through um, getting issue K1. It's a member driven um, banking system. So they do have a little better white glove like approach. But if you're going full on, I'm going to be a private company, venture backed or P backed company. I always recommend go with SVP or First Republic or Stripe. They cater to your demands, very uh, industry specific demands and more flexible rather than a very private setting uh, LLCs or S Corp like um, banking structure with a credit union. Great point. And, and it, there was a question about, about credit unions, which is why I keep uh, harping on it. I myself, when I set up L2 Council, tried to go to a credit union on the theory that I wanted to be closer to you know, the community at Stanford and went to the credit union there. And while they're great people, they just weren't set up to provide the kind of services that I was going to need. Um, and so it just wasn't, wasn't a good alternative. And I went back to you know, what most startups do. Um, and I, I, I love all my friends at SVB, Square One, First Republic, and uh, uh, PacWest. So I'll, I'll uh, turn it back to you, Vitaly, to the next question. Yeah, so there's a couple of questions about uh, inventions agreements and NDAs. Uh, maybe you can touch on that in general, kind of uh, one, one level deeper. Yeah, so your attorney should give you, as part of your incorporation package, a form of mutual and one-way NDA, and you should not have any commercial discussion with anyone that talks about 
anything related to your business unless that has been signed. Number two, you should not employ or consult with anyone that has not signed your lawyer approved form of confidential information and proprietary invention assignment agreement. When you go up for sale, the one of the first things that the due diligence investigation is going to turn up is, is they're going to compare your historical list of people that you've paid money to and people on the cap table with the list of people that have signed PIIAs. And anybody that hasn't signed a PIIA, they're going to ask you a million questions about that person and they may even uh, withhold a per part of the purchase price uh, as a, a special indemnity in case one of those people pops back up. Uh, a recent famous uh, example of, of not having a PIIA was when uh, Cruise got sold to GM for a giant, giant amount of money, a purportedly in excess of a billion. And one of, somebody popped up out of the woodwork who said uh, he or she was a co-founder. Um, there was no paper uh, and a giant settlement uh, resulted and the owners of Cruise had to give a big piece away to this person because they hadn't documented anything. And so it's a, it's a really important thing to, to, to get set up in your process at the outset. Yeah, and then there's a question related to that. Should founders sign those same PIAs? And Absolutely. Uh, they're, they're the most important people to sign the PIA. Yep. Very good. I think we're a little bit over an hour now. Um, we, uh, do we have on the next slide, we have our contact info? We can pop over to that. There we go. Yes. So um, please reach out to us uh, if you have more specific questions. There were a lot of questions that were a little bit too deep for, uh, for kind of general discussion and we thought might not be super, super on point uh, there. So um, we're happy to help. Um, along the way, um, GS Capital, we specialize, like I mentioned, in raising capital and M&A. Um, we typically, bankers typically get involved at later stages, at least at Series A or beyond in raising capital. Um, I have a lot of content out there. You can go to my personal website as well, golem.net, um, to see lots of videos and writings and things about uh, early stage advice. You can get my book on Amazon called Accelerated Startup. So if somebody comes to me for basic advice, I always say, go buy my book. And if you have questions after that, then I'm happy to, uh, happy to answer them. So accelerated startup. Uh, over you, Louie, Jenny. Uh, Jenny, please. Yeah, so just you know, one key takeaway, right? After listening to three very established, <laughs> my colleagues and myself, the one thing that I take away is um, just think about this, keep this in mind, and do not hesitate to reach out if you're not unsure. And a lot of times I dealt with uh, first time entrepreneurs, right? And when you do this, you just set the foundation right. It will save tons of time, effort, resources down the road. So that will be kind of, you know, resonating theme here. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thank you, Jenny. And, and thank you, Vitaly and Jenny, for joining. Um, I do want to do a, a short plug for Vitaly's book. Uh, hopefully you can all see it, uh, Accelerated Startup. <laughs> I refer to it often uh, just because of the number of great war stories. It even has legal advice. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to tell the state bar, uh, but it's a great book. And, and uh, I personally refer to it all the time. Um, echoing everybody's uh, good feelings. And, and uh, my email is, is here. And, and I love to help founders at, at all stages of growth. And people typically come to me at three times. One is upon formation two upon a financing event, and three when they're thinking about whether they should sell their company. Um, I'm happy to intervene at any time, but those are kind of the three uh, times that people come to me in. And uh, I have a great uh, network of, of people that I try and bring in to help companies from bankers to insurers to people like Jenny on accounting and Vitaly at, at, when, when it's time for some sort of fundraising or liquidity event. So thanks very much everyone for joining. We will make the slides uh, and a recording uh, available at some point uh, very shortly. And uh, uh, again, we'll, we'll do this uh, on another topic soon. Thanks again. Thanks everybody. Stay Thank safe you. as they say. <laughs>